An index is a power, so in an expression like x squared, the index is 2. There are three different rules that go along with indices, and unsurprisingly they have the thrilling name of the index laws. Let's look at how the index laws work. The first index law works like this. x to the power of a times x to the power of b equals x to the power of a plus b. So let's say you are given this expression and told to simplify it. Well, without the first index law, you would probably be forced to give up hope pretty quickly. But with the index law, all we need to do is add the indices 2 and 3 together, such that it equals x to the power of 5. The second index law works in the exact opposite way to the first one. It tells us what to do when two expressions are being divided. x to the power of a divided by x to the power of b equals x to the power of a minus b. Here's an example of where this index law might prove itself useful. We're going to leave the 4 alone. On the top, the index of y is 6, and on the bottom, it's 3. So all we need to do is take away 3 from 6, which gives us our answer. 4 times y to the power of 3. Here's how the third and final index law works x to the power of a to the power of b equals x to the power of a times b. This is useful when an index gets raised to another index, like in this problem. 2 times x to the power of 2 to the power of 3. Keep in mind that we don't only need to worry about the indices here, but we also have to do something about the 2. The reason why is because it's the 2 and the x squared that are getting raised to the power of 3. When 2 gets cubed, it turns into 8. So our overall answer has to be 8 times x to the power of 6. So those were the three index laws. And if you understand how they each work, then there's not much NCA can throw at you that you won't be able to deal with coolly. There are two more ideas that come from the index laws, and they tell us what to do when the indices we get given are negative numbers or are fractions. It sounds like a nightmare, but it's not. Let's start with a problem like this. What would you do with this? Well, that's an easy one. All you have to do is remember what the second index law tells us to do. We subtract the bottom index from the top one, and we get x to the power of negative 2, which as you can see is a negative index. In order to find out what exactly a negative index means, let's solve this problem using a longer method. We're going to start by writing it out in full. Now we can obviously cancel some of these x's out, right? We're going to take 2 away from the top and the bottom, which is going to give us 1 over x times x. Or better still, 1 over x squared. Remember, we got a different answer by using the second index law, which was x to the power of negative 2. Is one of these answers wrong then? The good but strange news is that, no, both of these answers are perfectly correct. In fact, all we've done is demonstrate the rule of negative indices to you, which is that x to the power of negative a equals 1 divided by x to the power of a. Now let's head over to the other special situation we sometimes run into with indices, which is when we get a fractional index, like 1 over 2 or 2 over 3. What do these mean, and what are we meant to do when we get one? Let's start out with this term. There's no really spectacular way to prove this to you, so here is what this fractional index is actually telling us. x to the power of 2 over 3 is the same thing as the cube root of x squared. This means that the numerator of the fraction gets attached to the x, and the denominator of the fraction becomes part of the root of x. Not only can we change x to the power of 2 over 3 into the cube root of x squared, but we can also write it like this. Both of these are really the same thing. Let's use this idea and look at a simpler example. How would we rewrite that x to the power of 1 over 2 is something with a root in it? 
Well, the numerator 1 stays attached to the x, and the denominator 2 becomes the root, a square root, which means that x to the power of 1 over 2 is the same as the square root of x. We can combine all of our insane index skills into questions that ask us to simplify or evaluate a strange looking expression like this one. Let's start by changing the square root into a fractional index. Now that we've done that, we can just use those index laws we showed you a couple of minutes ago to multiply the indices together. You might think that we're all finished up here and that you can finally lower your guard, but you would be wrong to believe that you're ever truly finished with algebra. We can simplify this further just by turning the index 4 over 2 into a 2. Other problems won't just give you x's and y's to play around with, but real numbers. When they do this, you'll be expected to end up with a real number too. In the last problem, we could only solve it by switching from a root to the fractional index. Here, it's the opposite. We need to turn 64 to the power of 2 over 3 into this. So what is the cube root of 64? If you stick that into your calculator, or just try out a few numbers in your head, you'll find out that it's simply 4. So we can go ahead and change the problem to 4 to the power of 2. And this is, of course, simply 16. Remember, expanding means multiplying everything outside the brackets with everything inside. Factorizing requires finding a common factor. We can simplify algebraic fractions by factorizing the numerator and denominator. The laws of indices allow us to manipulate expressions involving powers and roots.